Use like a magnet, lose won't have it till I'm doomed in a casket. I ain't playing, got a weird mind. If you work eight hours, I'ma work nine. If the shit tastes sour, you should taste mine. I'ma stay in power for a long time. Get up, nah, I ain't a quitter. Toss me the ball, I'm a really big hitter. Big picture, I'm a straight killer. Rice in the song to the highest bidder. Got juice, got gas, I'ma move fast. New shoes, new tracks, like who's that? I'm new, come back better than last. Yeah, it's a new me, never gonna look back. Never gonna look back. Cause damn, I was built to last. You move slow when I move fast. And that's facts. Only I can make a change. Slowly take a step today. I will never be the same. Cause that's what it takes. Good evening, guys. Happy Sunday. Welcome back to the Tony DeNaro channel. And May, welcome. Good to meet you in person. Thanks. I'm really excited to be here. I've been watching your show for a while. It's like, backstage fangirl so to speak <laughs> uh, i've been i've great. watched some of your live streams and your coverage also on on various stocks you you do a good job and i'm happy to have you on here as a special guest i just want to say guys uh for tonight neither may or myself is an attorney we're going to have a general discussion on fiduciary duty especially as it really what got me interested in this topic more recently Obviously, I've uh, read about it and studied on it before, but right now, because of this Allegheny lawsuit against AMC, it kind of re-peaked my interest, and we're going to talk about that. And I want to hear from you guys in the comments what questions you have, because I do have a, a legal expert, both uh, he's an attorney and a professor of law that has agreed to come on and talk with us about this maybe in a week or so once we get the scheduling down. And there's a lot of great questions. May, have you read through this Allegheny County versus AMC lawsuit? Yeah, I have read it through it. There what are a lot of allegations of breach of fiduciary duty. So I'm, I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are on that and what everybody else thinks. Uh, let me put this back up on the screen here. Uh, various counts of breach of fiduciary duty against the common stockholders. And uh, so we're going to kind of springboard off of that. I've got some definitions of fiduciary duty. I've d read some case law. Uh, I've looked at uh, some previous cases, and I think you have too in Delaware. Yeah. I mean, because most of these corporations are going to be in Delaware, there wouldn't be that much that was written, written outside of it that would come up first. I mean, I'm sure that like you'd have to type in the state if it was anything other than Delaware on your Google search. Otherwise, you're getting Delaware. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people are surprised or maybe don't even know how many of these big corporations are incorporated in Delaware. And uh, there's a lot of benefits to being incorporated in Delaware, including preferred stock, blank check preferred stock, exactly yeah. what AMC utilized, uh, typically utilized for... Uh, anti-takeover measures, but in this case, they they kind of did an end run to get creative and uh, create some, some liquidity for themselves, right? Yeah. I mean, I think it, this is such a, it, it, you know, in listening to the comments, I think what's always tough is that you do have a set of people that knew when things were really rough during the COVID period that they were helping the company out by buying shares and, and supporting it. And then it seems to me that there was a bunch of people that clearly were presenting this not in that way. And I can understand why, as a result, some people were very angry. Yeah. Um, and then you've got to kind of like all things, you got to play the ball where it drops. And, you know, in December, it dropped in a place where, to me, funding was required in order for them to get through. I don't. You know, if they didn't get it, then they'd really need the first quarter to be massively profitable. They would, I mean, they, they've crossed over to be slightly cash flow positive, depending on whether you think of free cash flow or whether you think of it more in an EBITDA basis. But it's it's like on a dime right now. So, you know, the, the definitely takes pressure off what they did in December. Hmm. Let's uh, let's look at some of the the allegations here from Allegheny. And then, and then just have some discussion on that. Yeah. Um, 
the plaintiff is alleging. Let me scroll down here. The director defendants, the direct, director defendants being the uh, executives at AMC, engaged in a disloyal scheme to undermine the voting rights of Class A stockholders and that the common stockholders would have opposed opposed and would not support further dilution of their shares. I think that is going back to that second attempt that he made to do dilution in, what was it, uh, late 2021? Yeah. I mean, on the first one, the disloyalty scheme to undermine the voting rights of AMC, I think my issue with this claim that I would love to hear from the expert that you have and you bring in next week is that if this was your problem, you should have filed the claim in August because not only did he create the shares, but he told you why he created the shares. Yep, absolutely. All of that was in the paperwork. And, uh, and even, you know, I've known about the the blank check preferred stock since I pretty much first got involved in this stock back in 2021. It's surprising to me that they would bring a lawsuit saying that you're not allowed to to create common, you know, preferred shares and, and give them certain rights and privileges and voting power. Uh, that's just seems like that should have been common knowledge for a professional in the industry. Yeah. And then also as relates to dilution, I mean, you might be able to argue that the stock wasn't diluted until you started raising capital, but the filings with the broker dealers came first because of what we saw in that NYSC video or NYSC posting that you listed that I covered as well after you recovered it, because it was really cool that you posted that. Um, but, um, <laughs> but, but in the NYSE, it, it, it tells you the terms under which it has to happen. So it's not like they did this as some very quiet private placement. They had to first work with the broker dealers to do an AT and at the money sort of transaction. So at any point, even before December 22nd, um, if they weren't for whatever reason, clear that that was going to happen from the August filing and the creation of the ape shares, then as soon as they engaged in that activity, that would have been your like second obvious moment. So that, that kind of bothers me. And I think the weirdness of that is just that whereas I can see a lot of folks getting confused on dilution, institutional shareholders should not be confused that when you raise capital on a preferred share, that market value it gets diluted by definition. So it's, I don't know. This, that I think there's, there's still a wide misconception in with retail investors, the ones that are, you know, there's this big debate going on right now about the yes or no vote on the proxy. And everybody's saying, just don't just vote. No, and let them dilute on ape. Can, yeah. can you talk to that for a second? Like, does that sure. make sense to you? Just let them dilute ape. It won't, it won't affect me. Uh, if I'm only holding AMC shares. Yeah, it's not true. There was one confusing wording. So this is the only possible reason why it could have been confusing. And I, I did a video because the wording in the initial um, December 22nd release had this bizarre, or sorry, the, the wording in the initial documents um, from August 22nd suggested that this was a non-dilutive share. And then the conversion factor was unclear a bit because of the way it was written. So that was, I was a little bit confused as well on that confusion, on that conversion factor. And I did a video, which of course shorts got mad at as well on that, which I didn't understand. They're, <laughs> they're always mad at me no matter what. <laughs> it's like, Oh yeah. Welcome like, to my world. I know my friends are like, get someone else to answer your comments. It puts you in a sad mood afterwards. I was like, but I feel like I can't, I can't let that get me down. I got to keep trying to answer no matter what nice as I can, you know, but it, it might have been confusing for the same reason it was slightly confusing to me because the conversion factor that was indicated in that document did not clearly state it, it seemed to be it was the conversion factor was related to AMC creation of ape shares. But it didn't actually I don't think he must have at any point thought that he would have to convert the ape shares back to AMC. And that wasn't an equation that was provided at all in the document and that, and he, original, he being who, um, you know, Mr. Aaron, I don't, I don't think he, I don't think like the, either that or the bankers are just really bad at writing mathematical equations and thinking through like, Hey, 
what would happen with Ape going back into AMC? I don't know. He he. It was always clearly stated that it was going to be a one for one conversion. Yeah, I mean that's how it said in the doc. But it, it but and you're right. A lot of folks told me that if you ever met him in person, he would tell you that very directly. And so I, you know, we've talked about the fact I'm still kind of coming up to speed in some ways over the last over the period that predates everything that isn't in writing. Um, but yeah, so so he had said that, and then that's when I hit up investor relations just to double check because of the way that it was worded in documents versus what everybody was telling me he had said in person. And then it, when the proxy came out, they made it super clear that it was, it was going to be one for one. And there was app that there wasn't any weird, um, modification of the dilution. So, and, and just to clarify, a lot of folks also don't realize that it's not just Ape and AMC, there is an instrument that sits between Ape and AMC. So Ape is the preferred equity units, and then there is preferred stock that sits in between. And I think that's why people get confused with the math that's printed right. um, and everything. It's unfortunate, but at, if they dilute Ape, they definitely dilute AMC. That's why the spread is so irritating even if you're a shareholder of AMC, quite frankly, it's not a great thing. Um, and then what he's, the only thing that would happen if the share vote doesn't go through is that he still has to raise capital through the ape share class, which absolutely is going to dilute both share classes. But because it trades at such a massive discount, he doesn't get as good of rate every time he sells your a, a percentage of the company. So if we stop calling them share classes and just call it a percentage of the company, every time shares are sold, you're selling a percentage of the company. But because you have to sell the ape shares, you're going to be selling a percentage of the company for what definitively is a lower price. And that really sucks for everyone that's an actual shareholder and not just day trading this or short selling it, praying that we don't understand it, that sort of thing. I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs> no, that was good. That was a good summary. So the second point that they're talking about here is that the, the, before we get into the fiduciary duty part, I just want to read what their complaints were on fiduciary duty, that they are neutralizing and circumventing the common stock class A holders and issuing the preferred stock with super voting rights because of the fact, I'm not going to read all that, but because of the fact that uh, AMC is in the uh, deposit agreement with computer share, they, uh, they set it up when they created ape to th that they were going to instruct computer share to vote proportionally for any non cast vote. So if there were uh, how many nine, there's 900 million, 900, yeah. let's just roughly, well, yeah. if only a hundred million apes voted the rest, the other 800 million would be, cast proportionally even though they weren't voted right yeah so that's the allegation that uh, this is also a breach or illegal and I, I did look up some other corporations that had done these similar type things and uh, this is probably the most compelling argument that i think that the plaintiffs have because other corporations in their preferred share or uh, depository share agreements they, in, they specifically say that any non-cast votes for depository receipts like APE would not be counted. So yeah. AMC is kind of breaking new ground here. And what is that uh, NYSE rule? Is it 452? NYSE 452 right. says that in a special election, a broker cannot cast a vote that, you know, that's, that wasn't cast. But there's, it's not talked about what a depository like computer share can do. So I think this is a, a interesting area for for Chancellor Zern. I think that's I her name to, I mean, to, to dig into and maybe make new new uh, court opinion on. What do you think? I, it's such an interesting one because I mean, in fairness, the, the intriguing thing about this one. It has to do with the fact that if you're an ape shareholder, it's pretty unambiguous which way you should vote. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So, so like if you're going to make a big stink about something like this, I mean, fair and square, then all the ape shareholders must turn in their proxy. 
Um, and some of that is like my broker, for example, has not delivered my proxy yet. You know what I mean? So, so some of that is just the annoying aspects of what it means when you do very quickly a special uh, meeting and a few of the broker dealers, especially those that are younger, aren't accustomed to actually making sure shareholders get their proxies in time. So that's just an unfortunate logistic thing that's happening. Um, I don't know. I can't wait to see what he says. That's a good one. She. It's a she. Oh, she. Oh, awesome. <laughs> he says. So that that is the, basically the summary of the breach of fiduciary duties. Um, as I'm looking through this document, there's really nothing else in here. So then really, let's let me pull up the screen of, uh, hang on one second, my, my fiduciary duty talking points here. Yeah. Yes. Can I let that dog out here run around you? Yeah. Some of the bunnies are under the bed. Yep. I'm going to feed them and then I'm going to go to the grocery store. Okay? All right. What is a fiduciary in a corporation? A fiduciary is someone who acts on behalf of the company. So in this case, it, this is talking about the, the directors and the board. Right, the the executives and the board. There are, I mean, three basic duties that that most people know about. Um, there are some other ones that I that I dug up. With the the fifth one, the duty of oversight being some more recent rulings, but duty of care, duty of good faith, and duty of loyalty are the uh, the three basic tenets. Does this uh, look familiar to you, May? Yeah, that looks like a lot. Of the the that's why I like that one paper is because he laid it out so easy for us social media folks to try to help out. Yeah. Duty of care um, when acting on behalf of the corporation, when making decisions, fiduciaries should stay informed of all pertinent information and when necessary, use the advice of experts. An example of breaching this duty would be hiring an executive director without asking for a resume. And I put a couple of, uh, I'm not going to click on all of these cases, but uh, if any of you are watching this later, you can look these up. Uh, these are specific rulings, uh, most of them by the, uh, the Chancery Court in Delaware on these specific uh, fiduciary duties. Duty of good faith is that uh, executives or fiduciaries must exercise good faith and honesty in all business dealings, while the duty of care requires them to investigate the situation before acting the duty of good faith requires them to make decisions that best serve the interests of the company. And this is where I think uh, a lot of people uh, get twisted up in, in thinking that they are, that they want the executives to make the decisions in their best interest. And really the, the fiduciary's interest is to the company. And, and then by extension, as owners of the company, we benefit or get screwed by those decisions. But their primary uh, obligation is to the company. Yeah. That's what makes this one so odd. And uh, and and then the, the secondary thing, and, and keep in mind, guys, I'm trying to stay as unbiased in analyzing this. I'm a shareholder I would like a short squeeze too. I understand 100% of everybody who is uh, clamoring that all decisions should only be made to uh, foster a MOAS. Like no matter what else, that is all I want. Just that's your fiduciary duty to, uh, to hand me a short squeeze. That is I, unfortunately probably not how the court is going to see it because this company is running low on cash and some of the choices they've been making are for the, the best interest of the company. And as a shareholder, uh, if they don't make those choices, the company, you know, is at high risk of bankruptcy. Would you, what, what are you, what are your thoughts on that, May? Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I oftentimes think as well, as relates to those that are really so aggressive about wanting to short this company and being really kind of aggressive about the idea that he doesn't need the capital. You know, I mean, this capital doesn't just, as much as everybody tries to pretend like he used the money for things that were not going to help the company, we've seen the popcorn come out. It's, I think it's doing quite well. Um, 
because, you know, that's to me, these these ideas are kind of what's necessary to keep to bring the company into the next phases. I think it's going to be really hard for them to prove that he's not doing things for the health of the company. Um, and I mean, to get to get your funding mix improved during a period of time when largely speaking, the high yield debt markets have closed down is really impressive. So I know like some people on the jargon, high yield debt is anyone that doesn't have like a pristine credit rating. And by definition, given what's going on with this company, they don't have a good credit rating. So they really don't have when when you've got rates going to do what they're doing and you've got the rest of the marketplace turning off the spigot of uh, financing because things that are very high credit rating are actually giving much more yield. Right now, he's like one of the few people that's been able to fix his debt situation or improve his debt situation. It's not totally fixed, in fairness. To me, that is a huge, huge win for the shareholders, despite all the other stuff that's going on that folks are focused on that are more, you know, Moas related and otherwise. I mean, it's a big deal because yep. it really has bought them runway. It's like if you, if you like, <laughs> it's like if you were having problems paying your bills and you know your credit score is not that good, and suddenly someone comes in and like through their just sheer brain power figures out a way to restructure your credit card debt and your housing debt into something that has a lower rate. That and also because of that, you know, some of it they're going to have you um, maybe sell something and get a bunch of money for it so that you can then pay off one piece of that debt. That's essentially what he did. It was like some, that that's what he did for this company is the equivalent of that. And I've had lots of friends that had to do that over the years because, you know, where I grew up, not everybody uh, figured their way out of that kind of thing. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> look, it's a real part of life. Not everybody gets a job that helps them pay this off and, and whatever it is that they're doing. And so that's essentially what he's doing is he's, he's pulling these, these different, um, they're not really tricks so much as like he's sitting there negotiating like crazy to try to reduce the debt. We could help him out by not having one. We, we could help him out by not having eight trade at one seventh the price of AMC. Some people will definitely allege that they are tricks. Like I've, I've listened to space calls and, and seen other videos that, that everybody is yeah. accusing them of, of hoodwinking the process. And, you know, maybe, maybe that argument could be made. That is the argument. That's being made. I guess we'll know in a few weeks what the judge thinks of that. We'll talk yeah. more and we'll talk more on that in a few seconds. The uh, other one that I wanted to go over was the duty of loyalty, because I know that uh, this is a pretty serious one, guys. The duty of loyalty. Either the CEO is a crook or he's he's following his fiduciary responsibilities. And there's really no gray area in my mind in this. You either Either you think he's an absolute crook or you have to accept that he's uh, following the, uh, the duty of loyalty. Let's just read what it says. Uh, fiduciaries must put interests of the corporation above their own personal interests. This rule prohibits self-dealing, which occurs when a fiduciary acts or makes a recommendation, recommendation for the company that will benefit the fiduciary personally instead of the business instead of. Uh, if there's a reasonable possibility that a course of action might benefit the fiduciary as well as the corporation, that's a, a difference than the sentence I just read, the fiduciary must disclose the personal interest of the corporation and allow the directors or officers to vote or to decide whether to move forward with the deal without the person who's conflicted having a vote in that. So this, uh, you know, I, this is a good question. You know, a lot of people accuse Adam Aaron of all his decisions or just to make himself rich. And he's kind of in a tough spot because the bulk of his pay comes from the RSUs, the restricted stock units. Do you have any uh, comments on this? Any thoughts just from hearing me read that or seeing it on the screen? Yeah. I mean, I don't think that the RSUs put them in line with the shareholders. So yes. for me, I don't know how they'll be able to get this one through, especially since, like, I mean, if they if they ruled against it for some strange reason, there almost is no CEO that isn't compensated via RSUs at this point, let alone board members or even senior members. So I don't, I, I couldn't imagine that they would read it 
that just because he's he's benefiting due to pay structure, which I think it looks like he didn't like it doesn't actually look like he's being paid exorbitantly. I know as much as he makes and as much as that number is a huge print for anyone, right? Like, but relative to other CEOs, I I don't think he's like outsized for what he's making. Um, you know, and that's just look, that just comes from looking at other companies, not because I don't think that's a big number. It is definitely a big number. I would be thrilled if I was qualified enough to actually do that. <laughs> <laughs> then I'd be like, hey, Tony, you're awesome, but I'm off doing something else. Okay. <laughs> like, so I can't imagine that that would be, I can't see the court. We'd have to see what, I mean, I can't wait to see when this, when this actually comes out and we can see line by line why they think that they have a case. The last been, one I think, right, is, is, a, is the more interesting one. I've been uh, trying to think really, really hard on this whole, um, if we go, if I go back to the, uh, the duty of good faith, or sorry, the duty of loyalty that they must act, uh, their decisions must be, um, what does it say here? Like they can't sell, I, I, self-dealing is the, is the old fashioned way of thinking about this, where they're literally just trying to line their own pocketbook at the expense of the shareholder. So I feel like, I don't know if it was this particular line or something else I read, it would be like if you hired your nephew or something <laughs> uh, to, to be on the board or you hired your nephew to be a particular role so that things could go a very, a very particular way, even though there were more qualified candidates. Or if you um, owned a subs owned like a service provider to AMC and you hired them without actually vetting who the best service provider would be. I, that's usually where I see this. I couldn't figure out what they were trying to say he was doing. I, I wanted to hear your thoughts. Like when we talk about food, uh, executives have a fiduciary duty to the company and the shareholders, right? That's the, that is the base level definition. Yeah. And I, I guess I'm struggling with, does that mean that shareholders should be elevated above the corporation? Because that's what a lot of people feel like right now. And I understand that. Or does that mean that the obligation is to the corporation and therefore by extension, the shareholders, because if the decisions are with the corporation uh, primarily, then the shareholders benefit. But right now there's a lot of anger because the decisions that are being made right now on the proxy uh, are going to have some potentially short-term detriment to people that bought in at a, a, at a very high price in uh, 2021, right? Uh, with this yeah. with this potential of new dilution coming out after the after the conversion and the reverse split yeah i mean i have never seen it be the shareholders at you know over the company so and and i mentioned this a few times the only time that i've ever seen some a shareholder do something or even push a vote at the expense of the company is like that would be circa the 80s period where there were these like hedge funds essentially that they would come in and they would buy the company break it apart and force it to like they're they're they were truly corporate raiders and they did not care if it went to bankruptcy that's like you know, everybody likes to talk about wall street but the other movie that legit is about that is pretty woman <laughs> it might even be the better movie for any of the ladies that are watching pretty <laughs> watch pretty woman and pay attention to what he actually does for a living so i always want to mention that um but, but <coughs> you know, usually Usually it always comes out in favor of the company and it would have to be a specific shareholder that owned a bunch and felt that the best way to monetize the company would be to push it into bankruptcy and then break it apart and sell every part. But they, but even then you would, if you were going to do that, which is really not nice to be honest, and it would suck for all the shareholders because we would take it on the chin and that guy would legitimately be doing it in a way that benefited only him and very specific private equity people, which is why but whatever, um, the different line of thought. But um, yeah, you would you would just get a majority. You would get a, a majority to vote with you and take a board seat, like a like a normal corporate raider. You wouldn't do this weirdness. <laughs> I'm like not happy about this lawsuit in many ways. The way it was written, it 
it's almost like they took every everything off of Reddit and threw it together into 70 pages and filed it. Like it, it doesn't even really seem that well thought out to me. Yeah. Uh, and, and just from the basic premise of the, the executives have a very real fear, I think, of running low on cash. Like when they were, when we were in 2020 talking about potential bankruptcy, the company had about 300 million in cash. Yeah. And we're at 600 right now. Yeah. And so the risk uh, of the lien holders or the bond holders calling everything due or the risk of running low on cash, if, if there were to be a stumble anytime in 2023, is very real. The risk of bankruptcy, although we're not like on the brink of bankruptcy, it could be a quarter away or one, one government shutdown away. And so I think they're taking reasonable steps to protect the shareholders as much as some of us don't like it they're they're doing their duty to the corporation to to beef up the balance sheet on the cash side yeah if q1 q1 i've looked at some of the work that you've done i won't say i did my own work <laughs> as far as that goes but like you know q1 does legitimately look like it's going to come in pretty decently and if we can get a little bit of like a little bit of a clue of how the popcorn sales are doing, which I don't think will be a big part of revenue, but at least we can start to see that it's going to go okay. So we can project into the latter part of the year. So if he's right, and actually there's a lot more movies coming out this year that will help the company so that you could get about, you, you need the revenue to be like up almost 30 to 50% this year for him to be starting to really making enough money where he doesn't have to dilute further. Yes. Yep. It currently stands, I still think, I mean, I don't know what you think, but I still think there's a better than 50% shot. He's got to dilute one way or the other, depending on the first quarter, which I think he'll wait for. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very curious on the timing. If he does do a dilution after this is all yeah. done. I mean, and we don't even know like how long after this preliminary injunction of April 27th, is, is there going to be a decision made before that once they all, the parties to the lawsuit, see the results of the vote behind closed doors? Are they going to say, well, you know, it's a moot point because the, the yes in both AMC and APE was overwhelming? Or is the vote going to be mixed between the two and therefore one side is emboldened to keep on pushing with the lawsuit and drag it out? Uh, and then what happens if it does get dragged out past April 27th? I know uh, AMC is going to, you know, they can't go six months without raising cash. So now we got to what issue more ape. Yeah, it gets kind of ugly. If, if this lawsuit gets dragged out, the impact for funding is not great. And that's uh, something I think the judge is going to be looking at. Like is what, what is the, the fiduciary duty? Like is, is, was the company, don't they have an obligation to raise cash as efficiently as possible? If they do need to raise cash, you're, you're almost forcing them with the lawsuit into a, an inefficient way to raise cash and harming all these shareholders Yeah, uh, by, by more dilution than necessary because of the low price of APE. Yeah. And I, I really hope they don't drag it out. Okay. So like if the first quarter is really great, it might just buy them some time or maybe we just get lucky. I think that's a really aggressive stance though, that we get lucky and they don't need to raise. But if, if this, if this, if this lodge suit drags out for more than the first part of April, you are really pushing them to the very end. Cause I actually don't know if they could, they would be allowed to raise capital even on the ape shares as long as this goes on. That is, I mean, that is one of the unknowns, something I need to go read into more. Um, it's an excellent question. So because like, if you did that, if you, if you raised capital on ape, you know, this one, it would be either the lawyer or the banker or some combination of them just talking about it would be the question. Like if you raised capital on ape, knowing that this vote is in action, I think it looks really weird. Do you know what I mean? Because of all the claims that have been made thus far, um, you would really want to wait until the vote cleared completely so that shareholders that were going to buy in to try to help out the company and finance it knew what they were actually buying. So my other thought, um, if there was that uncertainty, is that they may, they may uh, take some of the preferred shares, the other 40 million 
if and and come up with some exotic way to do a private offering with those to raise cash if they need to. Yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure. I, I I mean, as relates to like, like they got to come up with. I mean, it would, it's so scary for them not to raise capital. I would imagine as a management team, it would be the same as you sitting there watching your bank account go down a certain way, knowing that you still have cash coming in, but not even trying to research whether you could re-up your bank account a little bit. It's It's got to be really scary. I mean, the company every quarter does use a lot of cash um, because it's still trying to like shut down certain movie theaters, close off other movie theaters, create like improvements so that people actually want to go to the theater. <laughs> There's it's, it's not, oh, it's weird. It's very interesting. The time I hadn't thought about the timing component of, of what it me meant for their fundraising activities. It's a really good point. Let's uh, look, let's look for some questions. Feel free to read one out. If you see one, um, I'm just going to restate guys. The vote is on March 14th. I don't care how you vote. Just please vote. And you have to have your votes in by 1159 PM central on March 13th for it to count. So uh, check your emails, if, especially if you're in the U.S. or Canada. Most of you should be able to vote and uh, call your broker if you have not received those. I Follow think up on that. I think one good thing to come out of this is a lot of people now understand better what their broker's doing too, <laughs> because I got a lot of questions where people, you know, if you've never received a proxy statement, not even an email about voting any of your shares, that tells you something about your broker. I mean, I've definitely learned what's going on overseas as far as that goes. Yeah, there were some, what is it that they have over there? Was it swaps? Um, some of these yeah, brokers? They're calling it CFDs or something like that, but it is essentially, it, it is essentially structured as a swap where it's not, it's, it has nothing to do with the actual shares itself. It's really the broker deal that's holding it. And yeah, you won't get to vote if that's the case. Yeah. The, uh, I think a lot of people, some of them realized as I was talking to them and, the, and some of them did not, that they don't actually even own shares at some of these European yeah. brokers. They're, 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 your broker is selling you a derivative product. Yeah. So yeah, it's an unlevered derivative product, so it's not unsafe. But in situations like this where you want to be a shareholder to try to, you know, positively affect the company or negatively, depending on what your deal is, like, you know, um, yeah, very interesting. All right. Questions, anybody? And keep in mind the questions, um, again, May and I are not attorneys, but I am going to be reviewing this as I get um, our next guest on in a week or so who is a, uh, not only an attorney, but a professor of law. So tonight is kind of like to see what questions you guys have, just to see what we dig up in this discussion so that we can have a more, uh, so I can help target his discussion with you guys in a week to your specific concerns. There was a question about whether short sellers could vote. That answer is no. You do not get to vote if you're a short seller. So yeah. Uh, they they will not get to participate in this at all. Um, I can't hear you. What's wrong with you? I can't hear you. I'm I'm on I'm on a live stream. Okay. Can't say hi, but I'm also asking you what's wrong with you. Okay. Do we need to cut it short, Tony? No, no, no. She's I I can't hear because I have the earphones in. I'm trying to pay attention to to the chat. So no worries. Anyways, the real I think she's household. I think she's going to a yoga class. Oh wow. That's awesome. Um, there's so many questions. This, your, your stream has a lot of questions. <laughs> um, will the cusp ID change when the reverse split happens? Yes, on reverse split, the, yeah. the QCIP will change. Although uh, in my experience, I don't know about May, but in my experience of watching many, many reverse splits, that QCIP change is irrelevant. I know yeah. that's, that's not a popular opinion. Everybody has their own opinion. We'll find out, but, uh, I've, I've yeah, watched I, it too many times, not make a difference guys. I agree with you on that. Like it's really, I mean, if, it, if it does create this wonderful scenario for all AMC and Ape shareholders, that is just something unique to the trading dynamic of what's going on here post the reverse split. Cause you've got all this other activity on it in advance, which isn't usually the case when company XYZ reports that it's just going to do a reverse split because you've got, you know, extra stuff going on, <laughs> but it won't be just because of the reverse split. 
The uh, Great Sphinx says, can Adam Aaron appeal if the judge rules? Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure both parties probably would have an opportunity to appeal if they don't come to a settlement before going to court. Wouldn't you imagine, May? Yeah, I think that's a really good, you know, yes, I agree with you. I think it's a really good question, though, related to our other question is if they drag this out, what happens to the ability of the of the fund to be able to capital raise? Because if an appeal is underway, then, then what happens? I mean, you can't make this company in, unable to access the capital markets forever. That's insane, given what its balance sheet financial statements look like. Arthur, what's up, amigo? Arthur is saying um, about the 14-day hold for AMC on selling, or uh, it was AMC that had the 14-day hold, right, on selling common after the vote. Um, yeah. Does the wait for the suit date count towards the 14 days. Uh, I'm in interpreting the document exactly as written, Arthur, unless they, unless they do a modification. And I think some of us are expecting that there may be a document modification coming because of the push out to April 27th. You may, don't be surprised if Antera and AMC don't issue some sort of modification. Have you thought about that at all, May? I don't know what they're allowed to do. That one definitely is a question for, for, for the legal person because I mean, all, okay. So generally shareholder activity all has to be voted upon at these special meetings. Um, it, okay. I guess what makes it awkward is that most of the stuff that you and I are working with is what was clearly stated in the August documents as well as in the proxy statement. And the proxy statement clearly outlined what needed to be done and what it meant, therefore, that you were voting on. I don't and, know. And the and the December Antara deal, that's the one that has a right, lot of you're right. Yeah, yeah. However, like the process and procedures aren't there's like some suggested process and procedures in the in their press release but it's all been very like hammered into specifics in the proxy in particular um since that's the one we're all voting on and um and i like i'm not sh there are certain things that you must vote on and there are certain things that you don't necessarily need to vote on to make changes on so for example if they could have gone away with it, I'm sure they would have just taken a general majority vote of shareholders that come in. But because the original August document said the only way AP gets converted back to AMC is if a majority of sh of all share all voting shareholders says yes. So that's why it's having to be done this way. As relates to the rest of it, there were some things in that August 8th that said that this is how it must happen if it converts. And I'm not sure if there's any exceptions to that. That That is a straight up lawyer question. I think. Yeah, we, we just, um, you know, in my group of other investors that are, that are digging through all these filings, we just started this weekend. I think we had a five hour wow. phone call. We were talking about the potential for a, a modification of the deal between Antara and AMC due to the dates, these restrictions oh, sorry. and such. I see, I see, I see on the Antara side. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I did not have a chance to, uh, after that long conversation to go back through and read the documents, but I'm going to, I'm going to do that again, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow so I can talk about it. But I just, my general feeling is the Antara AMC deal. I would not be surprised to see some modifications because of the dates are now all out of whack. Right. They were expecting this to be done, a vote and conversion on by March 15th. And there's dates that hinge off of that. And now we got pushed potentially till April 27th or later. Something good to think about. Vinny, Vinny says, is there a chance we don't receive our shares after the reverse split? Like what happened to Cosm? Uh, there's always a chance, Vinny. I mean, Cosmos, Cosmos got railroaded by NASDAQ. They, they, they went to their um, their appeal hearing with NASDAQ and NASDAQ told them either put in for the reverse split tonight or you will be delisted in the morning. So they had to go have a board meeting, approve the, the what is, whatever it was, one for 25, and then get the instructions to the exchange. And that was all very rushed. I'm sure AMC probably has all their paperwork ready to go. Uh, and I would hope that it would be smoother than what happened with Cosmos. But I mean, that I've never really seen anything as messy as Cosmos was. Hmm. I don't know that one very well. So wait, are you thinking like Antara 
will definitely – oh, so it's the 90-day hold period on Antara. Maybe I misunderstood what you are saying it's the, There's the 90-day hold, and then there's also another restriction that AMC won't do any dilution for 14 or 15 days after the vote. Okay. The one thing that does worry me is that the the part of the reason for the case and potentially because I really do think it's the short sellers that are so excited. To oh, support absolutely. The of the potential of a no vote. Yeah, absolutely. But, but um, given that it could be possible that they're trying to push out the ability to finalize and, and finish this because they want to push Antara past the 90 days. Let's talk about that for a second, though. Um, a, a lot of people don't understand why a short seller might be excited about a no vote, because uh, I think some people are so myopically focused on the high short interest and high cost to borrow right now on the common, the AMC shares, that uh, they only they want to vote no to force a squeeze on that, even though there's no real catalyst forcing a squeeze. Right. They're just fat, yeah. dumb and happy over there sitting on their shorts. Uh, watching the company get uh, liquidity risk. So talk us through your opinion, why you think a short would be most excited about a no vote. I think both shorts and day traders and people that were, so I actually think it's more than just at this point, if you're like may, which head hedge funds are incentivized for this vote to take as long as it possibly can. It's actually not even just the short sellers, right? So here's all the different hedge fund types that would absolutely enjoy this. Number one, the short sellers, obviously. We'll talk about why. Number two, someone that's a hedge fund that, that actually does it in a very particular way risk-wise where they buy the stock and then just sit there and trade volatility around the stock because they're really going to enjoy the stock continuing to move 10 points a day, like 10% up and down a day or every two days, as long as they can play the rig show. So that's the second type. And then the third time is just pure day traders. Because number one, if, if you're just short the stock, then essentially the fact that the spread exists, the fact that ape, you know, if the ape is significantly undervalued relative to AMC, if the vote goes through, you're enjoying the fact that there's always going to people be people that are going to be long ape short AMC. So that's the easiest and fastest way. But there's also just a joyfulness if you're a quant trader on playing Greg's show because the reason that that spread because that spread exists and there's a natural type of person that just plays that kind of arbitrage it means that there's a natural type of person that's always going to just keep trying to re up that so that they can, as long as they can make more than the 50 basis points a day that um, it costs them to, to lend it, you know, to, to do that trade. So if they're making, you know, it, so if basically, so, uh, okay, sorry. So, so that type of hedge fund is going to enjoy it. Day traders will enjoy it because it will consistently mean that the stock goes all the way to reg show over reg shows limitation of 0.5% more than the shares outstanding, then it'll come back and it'll go straight back down and it'll come back. And there's so many natural players of that, either the spread existing or the, the constant bouncing of the stock that, that it's just, it's a money-making dream, I think for a hedge fund. I don't know if I did a good job explaining it. No, but I think, I think that was a, a pretty good summary. It's the worst possible thing for us because all the while that they're trying to drag it out, the company has these issues with funding itself. And, and that that's the, that's the one that I really wanted you to talk about. Like the besides the 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 trading strategy of institutions being able to play this due to the uncertainty, uh, shorts also I think are realizing that uh, that a a no vote really hamstrings AMC's ability to raise cash efficiently. Yeah. I don't, I, that's this, I, I don't know that like the AMC shareholder. So I feel like there's like a lot of different parties. There's definitely people that love gaming it. They're day traders or alternatively, they just love momentum trading or they're really a really fancy quant shop that has a very particular way they're able to do it because it would actually take you'd want to have enough of capital where this wasn't the biggest trade because it's, it would be very volatile and it would be a little scary. So you, it, you know, they all understand it for sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Those hedge funds are not confused as to, as to the fact that the game, the name of the game is to drag it out for as long as possible without allowing the company to go bankrupt because that would actually kill, kill the magic 
you know, being, so to speak, I don't know. I'm always really bad with analogy. The money printing machine. The money printing machine, which is happening right now. So that would suck for the, for the hedge funds. Then there's a bunch of AMC shareholders that just, I think, may not be clear. I mean, there are people that buy and sell AMC daily. And so they're really just interested in volatility. And I get that. That is a real thing. You know, okay. I don't think there are nearly as nefarious. They just have a very particular game they like to play. Okay. And then there's a bunch of people that are telling AMC shareholders that the no vote hurts, that a no vote helps them because of the dilution, all those other things just aren't true. And that kind of sucks. And I also think that that body of shareholders doesn't realize that how, like, because the folks that tell, that say this have no idea how to actually read the financial statements, they, they don't have any sense for how like how very much so on a dime this this finance is. This is like a kid that just that just came out of college and maybe he has his first job, but we don't know if he's going to keep it. You know, like that's where the company's at. It's actually as scary as like a 21 year old that just graduated but doesn't have any job history and is like ready to buy like a pimped out car. <laughs> you know, <laughs> is def- like that's that. I mean, AMC is definitely more responsible than that 21 year old, but the finances look like that is what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's let's, not. Yeah. Let's put up some questions here. Um, I, I've been pinning them as as you were chatting, so I can come back to them because the chat's going by so fast. How confident are you that we will squeeze with a yes vote? Uh, I am. I am not saying, guys. I'm not a channel that's saying a yes vote guarantees a squeeze. Uh, yeah, me too. So. I don't. I don't have an, a sense for that kind of thing. I don't. Short squeeze dynamics are really a special skill set, and I'll leave it to the people that have that specific skill. Yeah, set. I'm. I'm not saying that you know things being spicy, the all the unknowns and the volatility, and and I don't. I just my crystal ball is not that clear to say it's going to squeeze or it's not going to squeeze. Yeah. So I I would prefer not to be pegged as someone who is saying uh, yes vote forces a squeeze. I have never, ever said that. Yeah, me neither. I'm always really clear. The short squeeze guys, you got a skill. I'll give it to you. (laughs) I'm only the number two ranked short squeeze specialist. You need to go ask the number one ranked those really difficult questions. What if there are more shares than votes? May I saw this come up on one of your live streams a week or so ago. Yeah, that you can't have more shares than votes. Explain to them why, May. Okay, so there is this concept of shareholder of record, and they really mean that word record. Okay, so someone does actually record whether or not you own legitimate squ- shares, and then they then it used to be very manual. They, there was a treasury treasure treasurer within the board that would actually literally count the shares. And oddly enough, Berkshire Hathaway does actually still do it that way, um, which is crazy. But the reason that it's all on computer now is because so many of the votes are are done electronically, and so those votes will always match. That, by the way, in case you're watching all the other stuff on like um, FTX, which is really fun, um, that is part of what KYC is about. So just FYI, they need to know that whoever owns the shares actually owns them legally so that they can map them back legally and that they know exactly what's going on there. But, but what about the very real cases where overvoting does happen? Um, I have to look at like which one, what happened? I mean, I, uh, I, I can't give you a specific one, but I've read articles and I've heard, I think it was Susan Trimbath talk about overvoting and there are regulations in place. I posted it on Twitter, I think a week or two ago, um, when overvoting happens, which it does happen due to rehypothecation and, and some other things. Oh, wow. Okay. The, the, uh, what do you call it? The auditor there that is there for the vote they know how many votes each broker was is allowed to submit. They kick it back to them and tell the broker to go fix it. Oh, okay. Number one, I didn't know that that, that happened as far as I go. I will say that. But number two, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. That's, that is the auditor's job is to make sure the votes are correct and that there's not something crazy that the brokers are trying to do. And, you know, it's really interesting because the rehypothecation originally was literally just borrowing with no additional crazy leverage that's going to it. And that has evolved over the years, um, but I had not considered how it affects a board vote because usually on board votes, you don't get a hundred percent vote. Yeah. I mean, last time AMC voted, I think it was like 40% of the people voted or maybe even less. It was, it was really, really low and maybe we'll get more this time, but 
I think of interest to all of us is if we were to get a hundred percent vote, then there's going to be a lot of questions like, well, was it 110? Was it a thousand percent? You know, people oh, yeah. are so fixated on this. Uh, there's billions of shares, but guys, if there were billions of shares legally registered to all of you, why did we only get 120,000 people vote, 120 million people vote at the last uh, shareholder meeting? Like even if, if there were 5 billion shares and 10% of you voted because 90% were too lazy, we should have had a full count yeah. and we, we didn't even come close. So you need to ask yourself some questions about the validity of this uh, billions of shares theory. And then uh, of course, I know people are going to say, well, they just rigged the vote. Okay. If you think everything is rigged, I don't know what to say to you. Yeah. Vote but, rigging. Uh, is absolutely a violation of fiduciary duty. So if you could prove that, then yeah, you have a case against final, you will finally have a case. It's really what it is. Is that 100%? But the, the auditors are independent, right? They're, they That's are true. hired by the company, but they're independent. So, I mean, you, you've got multiple, multiple layers of illegality going on. Yeah. Here the auditor would have to go to jail. And also I think potentially the accountant on the entire 10K also might have some liability risk. I mean, they got business insurance for it, but it's not it's not something that they're going to play around with at all. So I, I don't think that we're at risk of an overvote, but if we get a completely hundred percent vote, then, uh, then I will, I will dig into it more. Um, so that gets rid of those two questions. Let's see this Canuck. Any chance we get to see the results on how they voted? Want, want to know how Adam, Aaron, and the other board members voted. I think that that is probably confidential, how everybody votes. I don't know. That's a good question for the, for the lawyer. Um, they in, definitely... in, the, in the shareholder meeting is what the question is. Oh, um, you mean during the open shareholder meeting? Ah, it'll be interesting to see if they broadcast it, because sometimes they do actually broadcast the meeting itself, but then all it is is a secretary at the end at the end reads the vote. It, it is broadcast at 11 a.m. So we'll be I'll be okay. live streaming it. Oh, cool. OK, we'll, we'll get to hear the AMC vote, the, but they were, are not going to publish the ape vote due yeah. to the court order. OK, and then if BlackRock votes. We don't we're not going to get a. Uh, a breakdown of how BlackRock voted in the proxy, if that was the question, right? I've yeah. never seen that. There is an oddity too with BlackRock, um, and it's just in general with all of the the fund, the, the bigger funds that most that ha have a huge percentage of them in passive investment. Just it's like a part of their composite index that they sell to investors, um, and that is something that is kind of like still coming out as an issue. Although I got to say BlackRock made it the core part of their investor call because um, I think there's some special drama going on with BlackRock right now. And that is the idea that, um, in, okay, it actually goes back to Exxon, the ExxonMobil uh, situation that happened. But um, a lot of folks think that because the top three managers voted with that one activist investor that had like a 1% vote, that um, that's really kind of messed up since they own for pretty much all the large cap companies, at least they own sometimes as much as like 45% of all stock just through those passive index funds. In small cap, it varies depending on which stock it is and how big a component of their passive index it is. And so um, oddly enough, at Berkshire Hathaway, they made a big stink about it. Not a big stink. It was like for him, for that particular guy who is such a like, like they, <laughs> for those two who generally just say their piece and then move on quickly, it it did it, there. If you Google search it, you'll find it. Um, or I can give Tony the link afterwards. So to make it easier for you guys to yeah, find. send it to me, but they, they were like, you know, they were a little upset, but at the same time, they've taken care of that because all the, because they just are the majority holders by a lot, not by a little, but still it's not even like something that he's cool with, but cool with at all. Um, so it's not an insignificant, it's a great question. I mean, I think this question is really cool, quite frankly, is, is what I'm saying to Mrs. Tahiti. Yeah. Uh, and um, I, I don't know the answer, but I think BlackRock yeah. said in their call that they would just, uh, that institutional investors that were, that they were managing money on behalf of had the ability, even in the passive instruments to say, all my votes go this way. 
So like if some pension fund had outsourced, you know, whatever it was, then that pension fund could indicate it. But they didn't have that yet for the retail folks to come in and be like, look, I own AMC through this ETF. So you will vote this way for me. Um, so I don't know with BlackRock, but but that in general is a good question for like, what is this marketplace going to start to look like? Um, All right. Well, we'll dig into that one a little more um, before the next before the next uh, iteration of this topic. Ms. Tahiti, what's going on? Uh, Ms. Tahiti asks, after reverse and after dilution, would there be any reason why other big investors wouldn't buy in? I'm going to let you take a stab at that one, May. I think it would just depend. What we really, it, it's the, the reverse split and the dilution are to fund itself, but it always is going to come down to valuation and what people think is going to happen as the company moves through it. I mean, for me, I bought the Ape shares, as you guys know, and that was because they were under a dollar at the time because that was right in the middle of the drama and it was one seventh the price of AMC. And so when I did the math, I was like, okay, this thing is about one times sales on AMC plus the shares together. But because I'm getting this at one seventh the price, I'm actually paying a fraction of sales um, relative to you know, relative. Yeah. So do I think that they're going to figure this out on the debt side? I kind of feel like he's like, given that guy's resume, I was like, I feel like he'll figure something out because what he did with Vail Resorts, I still remember when I first was learning stocks and stuff, what he did there. Um, and I was like, this guy's really smart <laughs> as far as that goes. I was like, he's a, he's a legit um, guy to try to to make that happen. And then Adam, people, Adam Aaron, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And then like three weeks later, he's got this really intriguing financial structure that's worded very particularly. I'm like, OK, I wasn't wrong. The guy does know his way around investment banking and financing. So so there's that post dilution. I think you kind of have to see how it trades. I'm sure that this has stayed on the radar screen for different people. And we hopefully, knock on wood, start to see all the hard work that he's done that has nothing to do with funding the company um, start to you know, bear fruit. The fact is, though, it's not wrong for him to spend this much time funding the company. That is a major job of management is just make sure there's enough capital and then just put good people in the seats to actually make sure the theaters run well, et cetera. So, you know. It's, it's so hard to... to, uh, to put big institutions in one bucket because they all have different reasons for investing. Some are, some are investing because they have index tracking funds. Yep. Some are investing because they're uh, technical or momentum trading it. And some are just day trading in and out. So I don't know that there's one yeah. specific answer. Yeah. And a lot of them are going to be looking like May said at valuations. I mean, the, the kind of investors that are nicer and calmer are your fundamental value investors that are like, OK, I know what to do with this. I see him turning the company around. This is what the valuation probably makes sense at. And then we'll be fortunate because that they, they don't tend to like trade around it like crazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, G Immortal, what's up? Um, he's asking, how can it be a one to one conversion with the float being different? That is, I mean. I'll let May take a stab at it too, but the way that the way that the ape document was written when it was created is that uh, when the company decided to offer a vote up to shareholders, the float of common stock would need to be increased such that all of the ape could move over one for one. It doesn't. There could be five billion ape if if it, this does not go through, and we're looking at a vote five you know, two years from now, and they've diluted 5 billion apes, your next vote is going to say, we need to increase the float to 5 billion AMC to bring all those over. Yeah. And meanwhile, if it does dilute that way, you will have sold, you know, a huge slug of the percentage of the company at a price that doesn't make any sense. So you'll actually get diluted worse than you should. Uh, not the other way around, as some of the short sellers love to try to convince people. It's really I've been I've been that. hammering that point home now for the last like thirty days or six weeks that freaking ape dilution is diluting you. If you hold AMC, yeah. you are selling your ownership in the company to someone for pennies on the dollar and giving them very cheap votes to screw you over next time. Right? I mean, if if this doesn't work out and there is a next time. 
you're you're going to be handing them very cheap votes and you will yeah. lose the next one if you don't lose this one um this one from scouts outdoor services i did a video on the pr uh, price after conversion on friday please go check that one out okay so uh, and it, and i went over john merriweather's email as well yeah that's th i like the this is an interesting thing because I do think it gets really confusing. It does absolutely go to whatever price AMC is. So on the day that this finalizes, the the wildness of the trading between the two should be extra special. like Because the yeah. two prices have to converge into one price. Um, and there would be ne zero reason for there to be... It, I, it, on the day of, it will be the most interesting thing to watch. Because technically, it will absolutely be whatever the close of AMC is. But because there's so much additional short interest in AMC and the two prices must converge, the activity on APE will also be very interesting. And it will really give you a sense for what exactly it was the people that are playing this and have no interest in the company itself are actually doing. I, I, I honestly cannot tell you how it will trade other on the day that the, th the thing converges except that it will be very wild. <laughs> what, went, if, <laughs> what if the news of the lawsuit um, drops after, after hours trading is closed? Oh my God, so, it'll be daddy. <laughs> and then, and then let's just say AMC was trading at seven and ape was at a dollar. Let's just make up some numbers. Um, there are people, you know, John Merriweather's email basically said that uh, when the conversion happens, ape will be valued at the, the closing price. I, he didn't say closing price. It'll be valued at the price of AMC. Seven bucks. So, yeah. So people are thinking they're going to get a six dollar bonus in the morning, but I'm I'm kind of thinking like a little more conservatively that the exchange and or the market makers are they're not going to take that that loss overnight. That they'll rejigger it in the morning. They'll bring down the price of AMC and bring up. Ape will still go up, but not. You know, it's not going to go to here. I would say that the market makers, they're probably the most likely be to be doing that spread trade right now where they're long ape, short AMC. So they will actually be fine all around. Oh, you think? Yeah. Because, the, the, you know, technically, okay, I know this gets really confusing because Citadel has a hedge fund on top of the market making business. And yep. do they make money off the market making business? Heck yeah, they'll scalp the living daylights out of you if they can. Do you know what I mean? All day long. But the way a market maker makes money is very different from other formats that you might find to be annoying, right? So I'm I'm fairly certain if you're a market maker, you are not going to have, you, you're, pro you're, you're probably going to be long ape, short AMC. And then to the extent that there are, that that even because it's 50 basis points unless that unless that um un unless that price of borrow goes shootings even higher that's your best bet right because your downside risk if it's one and seven is ridiculous <laughs> yeah wherever it settles in the morning but 50 basis points yeah you know whatever <laughs> like no one will get mad at you for 50 basis points so so you'll probably do that just to make sure that that life is good and then it's just whoever's left on the short selling side, like, or, or the long side or whatever the heck was being played in the marketplace that can get a little dicey. That's why I'm, I'm, I, I'm just going to say to answer his question, I don't, I don't think anybody knows for sure exactly how it's going to play out. It's going to be, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be sloppy. Uh, it's, it's going to be very interesting. And I, I read John's email and I, I don't think that he's wrong in what he said, that uh, Ape will be valued at the, the most recent price of AMC. I just don't know, is he leaving unsaid the most recent price of AMC might change as soon as we get the legal decision? You know what I'm saying? Like to close yeah. that gap. Yeah. I mean, the real question is if, do they announce it after the close and then right. you have this crazy nutty trading in the aftermarket? And then I don't know, to be fair, I don't, I didn't read carefully enough to know if they allow a full trading day and then it really would be the next morning announcement. You know, I hadn't thought about the timing of the announcement. Like I always feel like these things are announced middle of the day, but if it's announced 
Oh my God, this could be so That ugly. was something else we <laughs> talked about on our phone call this weekend is like, when is the announcement going to come out? Like, are we going to get a leak from the people watching the court case at, at 2 p.m. Eastern? Or is the judge going to seal the decision until AMC puts out a official press release? Like how that information gets out affects a lot of things too. Right? Yeah. Wow. There's so there, this one's going to be such a wild ride. Like, <laughs> cause even I was telling David the other day, I was like, there is no, he's like, well, they're going to seal it. So we won't know what the vote is. I'm like, come on in 2023, how are they going to seal it? There's not going to be one hacker yeah. that's really interested in AMC. <laughs> like, I heard y'all talking about that. Yeah, I was like, it's not possible. There's no way it doesn't get leaked. Most people I think are assuming it's going to leak. Yeah, I think so too. Ether says, uh, what is the plaintiff going to be asking for in discovery? I know they've already done the, uh, what is it? The sec Is it section 220, May? Do you remember where they can go in and ask to see uh, board meeting minutes and stuff? Yeah. Um, they've already done 220 requests. They've gotten board meeting minutes and votes. Um, that has already been done. I don't know what else they're going to ask for, but they can literally ask for anything. Yes, emails phone texts, um, all sorts of stuff they can ask for in discovery. And then try and, this out. Oh, and I then they'll, they'll, they'll go through all of that and, tr and then try and formulate their case to pitch to the judge. And look, if, if someone did something wrong uh, on AMC's part, then that needs to come out, right? If AMC... AMC and Antara both have very good teams of attorneys. I'm quite sure all of this was, uh, what's the word may, uh, vetted by the attorneys for legality. I have no doubt of it. I mean, unless, I, unless somebody was doing something, you know, behind the scenes and not telling the attorneys. I, okay. So I know I always have to avoid conspiracy theory, but there's, there's always the possibility Antara just literally wants to keep the trade going. Do you know what I mean? The money yeah. machine going. And yeah. so they don't even care. They'll just like, they'll just like come up with like, a, they'll just drag out discovery as much as they can. And that, oh, man, it would be really exciting with your lawyer, the lawyer for, person that you have coming on next week has to say, how long can they drag it out? And how long will the court of Delaware? Because I think Delaware is the one place where they don't really take they don't take these things lightly and they're, they're accustomed to getting lawsuits of this, this sort that may be oriented towards disrupting the ability of a company to do business. And they don't like that in Delaware more so than any other state. So it'll be interesting to, this one's, a, I, I don't know. I can't wait. I can't wait for the, the true expert to come in and let us all know the answer. <laughs> Migto says, uh, could there be criminal referrals if the ape shares are null nullified? Um, I mean, the, look, the what AMC did in creating the ape, guys, I can tell you for 100% fact, they are not the first ones to do this. Use preferred shares to create depository receipts. The the wording in AMC's documents is is literally copy and paste from attorneys uh, textbook on how to create depository units like ape. I've, I've found it the exact same wording in other corporations. I've found it in legal websites here. Just take this, use it, create your document. What AMC did was 100% legal. I can promise you that. Um, as far as this being a criminal case, this is a civil case. So I don't think yeah. anybody's going to jail, but the plaintiffs are suing for potential damages, I, I believe, if if not at least just to to stop the uh, to stop the vote vote from going through. I mean, the interesting thing, I'll just throw it out there for us ape and AMC people, in case one of you actually cares enough. I would probably not have the energy for this kind of thing. The real question is, if this drags out even a little bit. Could the ape shareholders counter sue? That's exactly like, I mean, when we talk about fiduciary duty now, now some of us are going to be harmed by the lawsuit yeah. getting dragged out. Like maybe yeah. we can file suit against Allegheny. I, it's so weird too. Allegheny's website 
clear is really shows that they externalize most of the asset management. So I have no idea how someone got them to agree. Like, I don't even think they have in-house money managers anymore. And if they do, it's the smallest part of the book, given how they've written their documents on their website. So how they got dragged into this has got to be like, I, I would love to just interview the like someone from maybe you can figure it out because you're you've got a little more resources. Than uh, I, I, do. I have my I, I have my ideas, May, of how yeah. they got involved. Oh, are you allowed to tell tell them, or you feel like it's too? It's it's uh, it's speculation, but the okay, okay, okay. The, <laughs> the lawsuit is so poorly worded. It's like some guy it, on YouTube took all of, like took all his conspiracy theories and his anger and took it to a judge. I mean, a, an attorney. And he's probably neighbors with the guy that manages Allegheny. He's like, can I take this vomit of bullshit and sit down with your attorney and create a lawsuit? So do many you, problems. Do you own one. at least one, one share, Mr. <laughs> Allegheny County? Do you own at least one share so we can, we can make this happen? And I'll mow your lawns and cook your barbecue. Oh my I God. mean, the <laughs> other, the other lawsuit, the, the Mr. Munoz, that one was fairly well put together, but the Allegheny yeah. one is just a hot mess. It's a hot mess of nonsense. Straight. Oh my goodness. All right. Um, what time are we at? Cause I don't want this one to go all night. We'll go. Yeah. Can you yeah. do nine more minutes, May? Sure. That sounds perfect. <laughs> if you're just joining in guys again, thank you for joining in. May and I are not attorneys. I'm going to be reviewing this and all your questions that I couldn't read because the chat's going by way too fast, uh, but we will. Uh, I am expecting planning, talking with uh, an attorney slash professor of law to go through your more detailed questions, stuff that we either didn't see, didn't address, uh, or couldn't answer tonight. So, And feel free to drop them down in the comments if you're watching this video on replay on my channel or on May's. May, do you want to give your channel uh, name a shout out for, sure, for anyone who doesn't... Uh, follow you yet so they can go subscribe and then tell us, I don't even know anything about your background. So tell us, oh. give us your, give us your elevator pitch. Okay. I, I markets with May is my Instagram, my Twitter and my YouTube. I started it about a year ago. I used to be on clubhouse and I was talking with some people and they were like, May, you should just do this on YouTube. It'd be so much fun. And so that's what I did. Um, by way of background, I actually did work in institutional finance for a really long time. I've done, a lot of different roles. Um, I started in research sales at a big investment bank, and then I worked in this one area of another investment bank that did uh, both index providing and index construction, which is very quantitative. Um, I like was selling this mathematical model to hedge funds. I did actually work at a hedge fund. So all of you guys that always say that, that is true. I've never tried to hide it. Okay. Um, I used to help them actually with their short portfolio, which is why I tend to know a lot of really random stuff about shorts. And then after that, I went back to grad school. My, my, my background is in actually quantitative methods. So it's like a stats background. And then I worked at a firm where I managed risk for a bunch of hedge funds and across every asset class. And then I decided I didn't want to do that anymore. I took a few years off to travel the world. And then I don't necessarily want to go back into finance because the environment sucks. So, I mean, <laughs> generally speaking, there are some really great people I met along the way. So I won't throw shade at everyone, but it can be like a very, there are, it's, it's, it's hard to find the perfect situation. A lot of environments are in fact fairly toxic as far as that goes. And so I was like, well, what do I want to do? And I, I, I do some consulting work from time to time for various people that, you know, just need someone with my particular skill set, and that's awesome. And then I trade my own book, and um, that, and then people, and I do this, I do this channel. So I would love more followers. You know, I, the one thing I will say that that really, when I first started, it was really more of a vlog just to understand even the most basic stuff like this software that you use. I actually use it as well because I'm <laughs> kind of slow with 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 any kind of social media during the years that I worked, all my stuff went straight to the SEC. So I had zero social media, even if I had it, I didn't post. Um, but then I realized over the course of doing this channel in the last year and a half that like media on, on companies is really bad. I mean, it's, it's beyond, it's, it's beyond biased. I should have known this because one of the companies that came into my office to present 
is a company called uh, Narrative Science. So I'll go ahead and out them. They got bought by um, they got bought by um, Tableau, which is now owned by uh, by um, Salesforce. And their pitch, this must have been like 2013, 2011, something like that, right? Some, somewhere early last decade. Their pitch was, oh, what do you think about our software? All, you know, you can program it to write articles or write letters or whatever it is. And all of the news companies are using it. And I yep. was like, so I was like, okay, interesting. So I called my friend who actually worked more in the IT side of news. And I was like, is this true? He's like, oh yeah, we used to outsource that to like English speakers in Thailand and the Philippines, but we got rid of those departments and just use this. And I'm like, I was like, what'd you get? What particular types of articles? He's, I was like, do you write finance articles with it? He's like, oh yeah. Now that all the data is going through the database, like it just they just spit it right out. And then I, I'm sure more than one of you guys have had an AI based news flow guy, like, pitch you on how he's got the best articles the fastest so that i gotta be honest drives me a little crazy because it's the opposite of investing in my opinion it's really promoting a very particular type of day trading that i think for the average investor is really dangerous i mean if you're if you have time and money to learn the skill of day trading if you have time and money to learn and put effort into certain types of things Okay. And I, it is its own craft. Like David, who I work with, um, and Richard, who was on my show, they have spent a lot of time and effort and have proven themselves really talented at that. But even then, they're not so cocky that they're not like, hey, May, what does this company actually do? <laughs> or anything like that. So that's how I ended up meeting them. But that's now all I do is really the social media. Any of the things that I'm talking about, I always tell you whether I have it in my own book or not. Um, and even Gurula is really just education based. He All right. Uh, so, since you came from that world, right? You said you worked in, in for an investment bank at some point. I did work in investment bank at that point, but not in the investment <laughs> banking division. Always in equities actually. It, All right. It, but it, since you, it. since you have traveled in those circles, like I almost went that way after college, but I ended up going engineering path. Um, my, my degree was in economics and my wow. minor was in, my minor was in banking and finance, but I ended up, I also have a degree in electronics. So I ended up going into the, the high tech field. That's awesome. Um, I almost did the whole New York thing. And uh, my son is up there right now interviewing with investment banks uh, tomorrow and Tuesday, he's a sophomore in college. Wow. But, uh, since you have been in that world, May, tell us, tell us the dirty coffee talk. Do you know of, I know people are dying to know, and you don't have to name any names. <laughs> Did you ever run across at the coffee shop by the water cooler out at the bar one night after work, people talking about, uh, fudding retail, in chat groups or with bot accounts or shill accounts, you know, the whole boiler room, uh, penny, penny stock type pump and dump shit, I mean, either to, to give them a bull case and pump them or a bear case and scare them. I mean, no, <laughs> no, like, okay. Even the type of trading that you guys are talking about would be high frequency trading. Those guys are super nerds and they're really trading on the movement of the stock. The, the, if, if you, it's a little bit mathy. I'm not going to try to do it this hour, but like that style of trading that you guys are talking about, that it wouldn't be necessary. They'd more likely be taking in data of other people that are doing that sort of activity and then deciding which way the trade should go. Um, if it's happened, I never saw it, but it doesn't mean that there's not one really clever weirdo that's doing it. But even then, I mean, like if you look at like who it might be, it would be like what Wall Street bets or something like who's big enough to actually create that kind of emotional response that people would agree. I don't know the answer to that. I, I hope one day we, you know, there are anonymous articles out there, people confessing that they used to work on a, a five man team to go flood social media with stories and they all had multiple accounts, but I hope one day someone actually steps up, puts their face on camera and says, yeah, I, I did that. You know? Yeah. I mean, it would have been my side because my side was always really fundamental people that did research and, and like learned about, look, there's a reason why I can go through these, these, these documents. It's not because I didn't 
learn from some people. I don't necessarily, I think, I think everybody has fair game to learn these documents as far as that goes. That's part of the, the other part of the reason why I did the channel, you know, and everybody has fair game to do what you're doing, which is really legit researching the company, trying to find information on what's going on. The, that's mostly what I saw. The quant traders that I saw didn't care. They were going to trade it. If somebody else did that, then they would absolutely trade off of it because it would become this mathematical indicator that was going off like crazy. Um, if there's somebody specifically enjoying doing that, I don't know. That's a very specific game. I'm not, I, I don't, I can't really speak to it. There was, yeah. <laughs> one, uh, one other spicy question, just to make sure that, uh, that people watch this video. This, I'm going to put you on the spot, May. Okay. <laughs> have, you, have you heard of algorithmic based trading? Yeah, for sure. That's what I'm talking about, actually. I, I know. I'm just, I'm this, sorry. Is a, this, yeah. is, this is a teaser setup because my audience okay. knows what's coming. May, yeah. what would you say if I told you there are people that are taking the stock pattern from 24 months ago and laying it over this week, predicting next week's action? I mean, it makes for good social media, but it's really probably not the best indicator. I mean, that that really, if you're doing that, that does not make you an algorithmic trader. That makes you a, like some sort of pattern trader, maybe. Pattern like, recognizer. Yeah, or pattern recognizer. I'm not going to lie that there are traders that do that. And then there are traders that do that and specifically have people around them to make sure that they do, if they do it, they do all the other diligence that's required, you know, but an al that's not what an algo trader does. An algo trader legitimately takes in 1 trillion and one data sets at this point. Like that's what makes it all so great is because of how just the sheer raw amount of data they're able to take in. And then they do this very, any any type of math they wish, but one most common one is called principal components analysis, the type of regression math. And essentially, essentially what they're trying to do is fit as fast as they can what actually is the most predictive metric. And then after they do that math, what they then do is like have another set of algorithms that that notices when that changes and then floods it with a different set of predictive indicators. And then they do this in this really, really crazy way. It's not, it, it's like... Uh, the weird thing is, um, I guess there's some people saying it, algorithms that all it really does is that for stocks like this, it speeds how fast the reaction is and it increases the 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 range of where it trades to. Like it'll just the, these volatile movements that we've been experiencing in the recent years are 100 percent because of this movement. And I, yep. I dislike it a lot. At the same time, for a fundamental investor, occasionally it gives you a real possibility to come in cheaply like i can't fight an algo but i can tell if it's like way too cheap you know so a lot of people get mad at me because every time they hear me say algo they they i don't know why they they keep in their ears they hear me saying i don't believe algorithms control the market and i'm just going to keep on repeating algorithms absolutely control the market but like may said they i, I always say they have thousands of input she said trillions but they no, are making surprised. they're like, making right, they're making decisions on on the microsecond based on many many inputs and all those inputs that are happening tomorrow are not the same as the inputs that happened 2 years ago. Yeah. You can't just pick a pattern from 2 years ago, lay it over this week and say I know exactly what's going to happen this week because I found a pattern from 2 years ago. It just doesn't work that way. I mean, it might work that way randomly. You might get lucky. Sometimes yes. people Random versus right randomly. <laughs> yes, that, and that's what our human mind does, right? Our human yeah. mind looks for patterns, and we see a pattern, and it's randomly matching to this month's pattern, but it's not predictive of what's going to happen next week. That's the problem because the inputs are changing second by second, minute by minute. Yeah, uh, you don't know what news is coming out tomorrow that changed the algo or change its behavior, right? You really don't. And they're real, the nerds that work on that, and I mean that with, because I love, you know, who doesn't love a good nerd, right? But those guys are nerdy, <laughs> they're really nerdy. So their math is like, I don't try to fight their math for sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. May, thank you for taking uh, some of your Sunday night Thank you out. so much for having me on the show. That was awesome. And and uh, I'll uh, once I have the uh, the phone call with the attorney, uh, 
later this week and, and go over with them, you know, kind of what the audience wants to hear, you know, what, what questions they have. If you want to come back for that discussion, whenever we schedule it, uh, so we can have, we can hear a real attorney talk about fiduciary wow. duty so and cool. uh, you can ask him your questions too. You're more than welcome to come back. I and love that. That'd be so awesome. Awesome. All right. Good luck with everybody in the Oscars and their Oscar picks. Cause I think that's going on, right? Is that going on right now? I think it might be. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Is the Oscars tonight fine. guys? Yeah. What is it? There's a, a popcorn event that Adam Aaron, I mean, Adam Aaron has his popcorn scheduled to come up with something. Is that the, the Academy Awards? Maybe it's the Academy Awards. Like, I think that might be it. Well, as much as we love to watch the movies at AMC, we're not really good at this part of it. Is what we yeah, learned. I, I gave up. I gave up on watching all those award shows many years ago. When it, I used it to got, watch all too. Yeah, it, it got a little bit too preachy for me, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's Pushing it's got a little strange. Yeah, I, it used to be much more fun to watch. Now I feel a little scared watching it. The they're, they're saying the Oscars are next Sunday. Next Sunday. Oh, oh, AVN okay. Awards. Okay. Oh, is that's, that right? That's is a that, joke. No, I know yeah, what that is. Isn't that the adult? <laughs> video? <laughs> Funny. Ha ha. <laughs> um, Mark says we need bingo with May. May, um, do you drink alcohol? I do. I get bright red. You guys will laugh. I have that Asian thing where I just get straight red. But I, I'm well, not I, don't, I, I don't know if you've ever seen one of my bingo nights, but uh, okay. if you're ever down for a night of, of just, on the weekends, like if you don't have something planned the next morning, we uh, we do a bingo where we we pick a topic or we pick a YouTuber, and I create a bingo card with keywords that I think he's likely to say. Okay, <laughs> you know what? That, that sounds like fun. <laughs> every time they say it, you have to take a shot. But I learned the hard way on the first one uh, not to do a shot of tequila because I was like, they were. They were filling up my bingo card faster than I could drink. <laughs> Can I just do? Okay. All right. So we, do, we switched the like, rules. Like it's a, it's a sip of beer. It's a sip of beer. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. And I should be okay. <laughs> it's a shot. If you fill a line, I got That's it. a little okay. more, uh, you know, it's a little okay. less embarrassing, a little more, you I'll know, so you can make it a full duration. <laughs> all right. So start, start practicing. Maybe all go right. watch the other videos and, and, and laugh at me. We just do it for fun. Just oh, weekend, fun. weekend entertainment. <laughs> you guys are so funny. Your comments are fun. Your 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 guests are or your your crowd is very funny. It was hard they're, to like laugh. They're they're a good group, and yeah, they try and trip me up every now and then. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks. We will see you on the next one. I got two videos already out for you tonight. Um, some recent talks from Adam Aaron on naked shorting, synthetics, and failures to deliver. And also an update from him from Detroit on Saturday, I think it was, or the third, whatever day the third was, uh, on Highcroft Mining. So check those out. Share, like, subscribe. You know the drill. Appreciate you. Thank you, May. Bye, guys. Have a good night.